I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to proceed with these drawing videos. I have here a tentative list of ways I'm going to try to cover the thing. I want to emphasize right at the beginning that my own training, it depended on a lot of independent work, but in the first instance, it depended on the help of a teacher, specifically Aaron Curzon, but others as well, but particularly Aaron, who gave me, first of all, eye training, in addition to inculcating basic concepts. That eye training, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it and, and how it happens. And I, it's, I'm sure it's different for different people. I had to get a lot of things beaten into me. So if you're someone who needs to have the thing beaten into you, either you're going to have to find that sort of eye training somewhere or beat yourself into it. In regard to training, I just opened up this uh, wonderful two-volume monograph about the great sculptor Houdin. There's the man himself. Uh, there's a description at the beginning of his early training. There was something called the uh, École des Enfants Protégés, which meant special schools for talented kids. So in France, uh, they would uh, take promising kids and they would give them art education with specially selected masters. They'd start out at about nine years old. And then as they got good enough, they would be apprenticed out to uh, established masters here and there. They'd go to several of them. And they were always competing for prizes. And eventually, they might win the first prize and go to Rome, or the second prize, second Rome prize, you would also go to Rome. And then they'd go after Rome, uh, often on foot. <laughs> And they'd spend a couple years there where they would be supervised. Fragonard, for instance, uh, had Netoir as a teacher, and they would be sending their studies back and forth to Paris for the supervisors. And, and you know, a lot of very intelligent uh, people would be dealing with their education and nourishing, nourishing them along. The king had great interest in their being uh, powerful artists serving the country. That is long gone. We've been through periods of other kinds of education which have also disappeared. So the artistic adventure of our time has to do not with reconstituting that as it was, but in reconstituting the essence of it as best we can. So in what follows, these videos that are going to follow, this is going to be my effort to uh, contribute to that reconstitution based on my own efforts to reconstitute it for myself. Not just sui generis, because I did benefit from important things that, that I happened on and lucked onto that were still going on. What I'm saying is that the task is gigantic, but it's not hopeless. In any case, we have to go forward with it. Now, I'm just going to show a couple of Houdin sculptures here. This is a portrait of his wife. And here's a portrait of his daughter, one of his daughters. Houdin sculpted all the great people. His, his portraits are unbelievable. <laughs> you have the living person in front of you. You feel like, you know, you can, you see their thoughts. It's, it's, it's as if they're alive in front of you. And Houdin was considered a, a realist kind of artist as opposed to the decorative tendency that was also going on at that time. The realist, 
idea took over in the 19th century. He lived into the 19th century. But even in the 18th century, there was a taste for the more realist aspect, which was considered more Roman in the old imperial sense. I just came across a citation regarding Caravaggio. Someone said to Caravaggio that he should study uh, the, the, the great masters, uh, you know, whatever it was. And Caravaggio pointed to the uh, peasants passing by and he said, nature provides me with all the models that I need. And Chris just sent me the remarks of somebody who encouraged him to become familiar with every last line of American poetry from the last two centuries in order to become a poet himself. As if Bach, to become one of the greatest composers who ever lived, had to be familiar with Mozart and Stravinsky, who'd never been born. So... My point is that art is something real. It's something that exists. It's something that's independent of our little wills and our little, our little histories and our little societies. It's there to be seized. The great artists who inspire us and who lead us into the world of art are not the, how shall I put it? They're not the creators, creators of art. They're the practitioners of art. They're the great practitioners. They can be great teachers. But, no, the, 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 the modernist idea you know, that everything's in the unconscious and that all you have to do is liberate yourself from, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's, there's truth in that, in the sense that it's in our unconscious, in the sense that um, it's real, in the sense that it's there, in the sense that if we, if we look for it, we're going to find it. The great artists can help us because they found it. But they are not it. It's not something that creates itself in history. The music of Bach is just as much music as the music of Stravinsky, and the music of Stra Stravinsky isn't more music than the music of Bach. These great, these great artists may help each other, they may playfully and slyly imitate each other. Let's see, what does the painter have to work with? Black, white, red, green, and the poet, the vocabulary that we have. Every artist is forced to use pigments, red and blue, and so nobody's discovering red and nobody's discovering blue. Art begins like so many things in wonder at the tremendous mystery and beauty, majesty and terror, as might be, of reality. So it's important not to get too carried away about the past, to have the right relationship to it. and. Everything should be kept in perspective in the sense that there is reality. And that reality is eternal. Page and figure. All right. Now, this is... Uh, this is a foundational thing. Here's our page. When I use the word page, I mean a piece of paper or a canvas we're going to do a painting on, or eventually a lump of clay or a rock that you're going to carve. What, 
the thing that you're going to make something out of. This, there's nothing on this page. But it's the it's it's part of the work of art. It's it's a it's it's an essential thing. So much drawing, people just think, you know, drawing, representing something, molding something, but it's crucially important. Oh, I mean, there, there, there might be a moment. There's a, there's a moment in drawing when you're just worried about representing a volume or something like that. But at, at a primary level, The, the page must be considered. If you're, if you're not doing that, if you're not doing that at the beginning, if you don't have that firmly in your mind, then the whole enterprise becomes, uh, becomes hopeless. Okay, so here, here is our page. Let me just pin it on this board. This is what we're dealing with. And we are going to put a figure in the page. Now that figure could be a nude model. It could be anything. It is our subject. Our subject is going to go in the page. There is a relationship between the page and the subject. And that relationship has to be foremost. Later on, I'll talk about the relationship of the figure to geometry. And by geometry, I mean simple shapes, simplified shapes. Let's start with the simplest shape, a circle. We're going to put our figure in the page. Now, how... How do we do that? What is the relationship between the figure and the page? This is something this is something to to mull over, to meditate upon, to drill into yourself and to and it should be your first consideration whenever you're drawing. The relationship between the figure and the page, the subject and the page, the subject could be, let's say, a crowd of a thousand people with uh, birds and clouds, whatever it is. The figure should fill the page. It should fill the page appropri appropriately. All right. What does that mean? That means that it should fill the page. It shouldn't go outside the page. It shouldn't just be a small thing somewhere in the page. If it's a small thing somewhere in the page, then it's part of a larger figure. Okay, so I'm going to try to draw a circle in this page. All right, that's about right. The circle is not perfect, so I'm going to correct it. Notice how it's not necessary to erase the wrong lines to correct them. The right lines will always prevail. Now, we could criticize this by saying that the circle is just a little bit too far to the left here. It's nice that maybe that there's more space down here, as opposed to there is, is rather nice as if the bottom part is a, a pedestal. All right, now let, I'll just correct the circle. It doesn't, it's not really too much of a problem that it's a little over the left. We'll just correct it a little bit. Now it's a little bit squat.
what is the underlying point? When you draw something, we're talking about true drawing, we're talking about the most fundamental aspect of drawing. You have a page and you're putting the figure into the page. So you have a circle, a figure, uh, a nude, uh, several people, whatever it is. It has certain proportions. The circle has a certain proportion. There's a center point, and you know, you know what a circle is. So that circle has a relationship to itself. It's going to be round because of the radius, the distance of the, you know, etc. But you're putting it in a page. You're not simply drawing a circle. You're drawing the circle in the page. So you're taking into consideration what the circle is in itself, what the figure is in itself, the proportions of the figure. You're taking them, so that's sort of the internal concern. And then there's the external concern, the, the page. And you're fitting that into the page. So you're getting the proportions of the figure correct. In other words, the circle will be round, or the square will be square. Or the rectangle will have the proportions that it ought to have. Two to one, one, two to three, whatever it is. The correct proportions. It's not simply that the thing is correct, but it's correct in the page by filling the page. So the subject has its internal logic, the geometry of the circle, or the proportions of the figure. It comes to the same thing. And it's placement in the page. So you have to master both simultaneously. It's not enough that the circle be round. It has to be round or the figure has to be properly proportioned. It has to be what you want it to be. It has to express the things that it must express and it must fill the page. That before any question of accuracy or properly representing volumes and so on, or you know, beautifully drawing or light or these other things, that's what you have to understand. The subject in the page, placing the subject so that it fills the page and that it's properly proportioned. All right. Now something else. I'm drawing a line. I'm correcting the line. So there's several lines there, but those lines are each the result of a deliberate effort. I'm not doing this. I, I, I'm not drawing like this. I'll show this again. All right. I'm a fairly experienced draftsman, so drawing something that's a pretty good circle, freehand, you know, <laughs> you know I, that's something I can more or less do. But what I'm trying to emphasize now is that the, the, the act of drawing is the mind. You want something, you want a circle, or you want a figure, whatever it is that you want. You're going to place the circle in the page. The figure is going to fill the page. And then you, you, so you, you have to see it as best you can. And then you want to try to do it. You don't, don't let the hand do it. The mind has to do it. I'll draw another line. I'll, I'll, I'll try to draw a diagonal from here to there. And notice again, you know, it's, it's not this. I'm going to try to do it. Maybe it'll be wrong. Not bad. Now I'll do another diagonal. No, that, that's not really perfect. It should be more like this. Correcting it a little bit. Now I'll try to draw a line right down the center. 
Now, crosswise. This isn't an exercise. This isn't anything physical. I'm just trying to show that when you draw a line, you have to be deliberate. You have to mean it. These are simple lines. This is, it's not as if it's legs and arms and so on, or a face. But you have to make the act of drawing be an act of the mind and not an act of the hand. I'll try to draw an even a circle in the middle of this. Not very good. Correct. When learning to draw, I learned to draw on pieces of 18 by 24 newsprint with charcoal. Always with the cloth, always erasing. Because it's important to feel free. The lines one draws, they shouldn't be something you're attached to. You're going for something. Let's say we want to draw a face uh, or a head. It's going to fill the, the page. Now, okay, that's the beginning. And now erase it. Make it make it be what you really want. Filling the page with the figure. Drawing with the mind and not the hand. Wanting something, a line, a certain form. What might that form be? You want a, a triangle. And being free. If the line isn't correct, change it. Erase it or don't erase it. Draw a correct line. Now, this is a this is a very basic business. And the importance of these things will come into their own when we start looking at other aspects of drawing. But get these principles into your mind. The page, the page is what you're dealing with. You're decorating the page. You're decorating a page. You're not, drawing is not, well, there's a, an aspect of drawing. Well, you know, I, I, I want to I, I uh, draw a three-dimensional cube. Okay. This isn't really drawing. It's just doodling around. It's, it's doing something. Drawing in the noble sense has to do with something that's a relationship to a page. I mean, eventually that gets us into composition because a composition is always a relationship to a page, a space. It, could, it doesn't have to be square. It can be, you know, in the Rococo time, they were painting on, you know, whatever it was, these shell shapes, and they, they'd arrange their composition in these crazy shapes. So it, it doesn't matter. It could be triangular. It's, this, it's the, the surface you're dealing with. It might not even be a flat surface. So then you're dealing with that. Or if it's a, a certain piece of stone, for instance, you, let's say this page is a block of stone and you want to carve a head or it's a block of, you know, it's, it's this particular mass of clay. You're going to do something with that. Or you, you have something in your mind. You want to sculpt something that's this big. So you're, 
that that's that's your thing and you're going to model that so the, there's a relationship between the page and conception you conceive of a certain painting you want the painting to be a certain size and so on. there's a relationship between the real size of, of the thing you're going to do the, or eventually whatever surface you're presented with and what you're going to do and, and that's that relationship is not I mean, it could be arbitrary, but it's not inconsequent. You have to deal with the page. So, drawing, painting, or sculpture, I mean, it's the same thing in architecture in the sense that you are, let's say, you, you, you have to conceive of a, of a certain building. So, that becomes... This, this, this basic framework that you're going to have to deal with. You're going to have to, you've got this much space and you've got to do such and such with it. You want to do such and such with it. Well, you have your page and you're going to put your figure in it. It's going to fill it in the sense that the subject will be fulsomely there. The page will be used to express the subject. And then, and I'm going to emphasize this throughout, whenever I'm doing demonstrations, draw with the mind you want something, the hand is a slave. Don't let it become, you know, oh, oh, oh. You know, there might be a moment like that. I mean, the hand is going to try to do, but. Now I've got a bad piece of charcoal here, but it doesn't matter. 